Hello Arts Society members, my name is Viv Laws and I've been a lecturer since 2015 and I'm also a university lecturer, a curator working with contemporary Southeast Asian artists and a writer. Now, as a result of what I do in my day job, I offer over 20 lectures to the Arts Society, but my most popular by far is on the Honourable East India Company, titled Chintz, Chinese Export in Chinoiserie. And in this lecture, I examine methods of trade, the East India Company, politics, economics, and the kernel running through the centre of it, uh, which I only spend about five minutes on, in fact, during the lecture, is looking at Chinese painted silks of the 18th century, which is actually a reflection of my master's dissertation over 20 years ago. In this talk today, I want to tell you more about this very specific art form, and I also want to recreate by painting, uh, in a speeded up film, you'll be glad to hear, uh, a replication of Chinese painted silk that's in my collection. This love of Chinese painted silk came about through actually my work when I was deciding what to do in my career uh, in the early 90s when I had a workshop on the South Bank of London and I explored painting on silk as an art form and I got particularly interested in some of the Chinese designs uh, that inspired me. This is a waistcoat I painted for my husband when we got married and I was so interested in the way that pigment behaved, the fluidity of the application of the medium, and also where the ideas came from, why Chinese painted silk was imported, because I'd seen it in museum collections, and also how they might have practised, how the artisans in Canton, present way Guangzhou, how they actually manage to paint silk, which is extremely difficult uh, uh, textile to handle unless you stiffen it with something like alum, like the Chinese paintings. But with textiles that have to flow, you can't do this. You have to paint on a soft uh, textile that is able to be worn on the body. So when I did my masters, I did my dissertation on Chinese painted export silks. And this is what I am going to be doing in far more detail today over this, over this next 20 minutes. To see Chinese painted silks of uh, spectacular quality, you need to go to museums. There is uh, an example of a mid 18th century Chinese painted silk dress in the V&A. There is also in the V&A's reserve collections a dress from about 1760 that belonged to Mrs. Garrick, the famous actor's wife of Chinese painted silk, which is a pale yellow background. And this really shows the naturalism and the sort of insouciant display of flora that was so fashionable in that mid part of the 18th century, and which in fact was a specialism of the brilliant Huguenot weavers who lived and worked in Spitalfields at the period. And in fact, the impact of the Huguenots is why uh, my, my next lecture is actually going to be about the Huguenots in the arts in England. But looking at the different designs that you get through the 18th century, you can see that what was produced in Canton was a reflection of European, what so Western fashions, including British fashions. And it's very clear from the East India Company logbooks, the ship's logbooks that are kept in the British Library, that patterns were sent out by the East India Company to be executed by Chinese weavers and dyers. And this would be the normal embroidered silks or the woven silks, but also the painted silks and the references are very, very clear. So what you're looking at with Chinese painted silks is a change over the 18th century in response to predominant trends. So I have in my collection a Chinese painted export silk, which I've dated to about 1770. And my dating is based on documentary evidence in the East India Company logbooks of designs being sent out through the East India Company to be used by Chinese dyers and weavers for woven silk, for embroidered silk, also for the painted silk. And this enables you to look at mainstream European design 
and therefore date the Chinese painted silk. And this is what you see typically in the 1770s. You either get a, a straight stripe, or in this case, a meandering stripe here, a very lightly executed floral imagery, as you see, and these wonderful scattered little blossoms that you see throughout against a very wide, open, spacious, airy background, absolutely typical of the period. And of course, comparable to something like porcelain, both European and Chinese export porcelain. And the attractiveness of these silks, which in this particular case were completely freehand painted, is what makes it so compelling and what made them so popular, both through trading through the East India Company as official goods, but more often as private goods of the supercargoes and the ship's officers that spent so much of their time toing and froing from Asia. So, I'm ready to start the replication of a Chinese 18th century silk. Chinese looms had two standard widths. They would either be set at two covids or at 2.2 covids. The name covid, the irony is not lost on me. It is spelt the same way as our beloved virus, uh, but it nevertheless was a genuine unit of measurement in Chinese textiles. Now, two covids is worth about 28.2 inches, which is about 72 centimetres, and 2.2 covids is 31 inches, or 79 centimetres. I have set up uh, my frame for stretching the silk at 31 inches. The bolt lengths also came in set, set formulae. So we have a 38 covid bolt, bolt length, which is worth about 44 feet and 7 inches, or 13.59 centimetres to be precise, or 45 covids, which was 59 feet or 18 metres and 26 centimetres. I'm obviously not going to be doing that today. I have just a metre length here. And what I'm going to start doing is to stretch the silk across this frame here. Chinese looms would have something called temple bars to keep the width, in other words, the weft of the fabric, stretched tight so that as it was woven and went through to the rollers upon which the length of the fabric was put, that you would have a nice taut silk. I don't know how the silks would have been stretched in a Chinese workshop, but my guess is that it would be something like what I'm doing now. I'm using three pronged pins, which uh, damage the silk very little indeed. They're very, very slender. And I'm going along the selvages here. Incidentally, Chinese silk selvages are very recognisable by their colour. They are either a sort of rich yellow, a sort of saffron yellow, or the colour of terracotta towards the browns. So it's very, very identifiable, the Chinese silk. It will be in those widths that I've just described and it will have the contrasting selvage. I'm just going to tighten up the fabric a bit further with the pins. Once I've stretched it once, I just get all the looser parts out. You need it very, very taut because that's where the control lines. If you've got any give in your fabric, you'll lose control of the brushwork to make the imagery. Now that I've stretched the fabric, I'm going to put it to one side and show you the pigments that I will be using and the brushes I will be using also. I have replicated as closely as possible the materials and pigments that were used in Canton for this particular trade. Now, the fabric I have here is a taffeta. Taffeta is a plain weave, but it also has the benefit of being very smooth, very soft, to have this wonderful sheen on its surface. And a publication of the Philadelphia Museum of Art from 1995, where they examined a dress in the collection of the museum, it showed that taffeta was used probably for about 60% of all export silks around the middle of the 18th century and on, because as a plain weave, it was, it was straightforward to weave, but also it had this wonderful tautness as well. 
Now, the glossiness of taffeta was achieved through a process called calendaring. And calendaring is a curved stone of this sort of shape is run, rocked backwards and forwards, a man would be standing on it, and rocking the stone backwards and forwards over the silk, which would be run through its entire length on a wooden roller that was itself set onto another curved base. This candering made the silk wonderfully tactile and that was part of the appeal, of course, of, of these silks. Now the materials I am using, I have taken from that Philadelphia Museum report. So what you see as a binding medium, so any pigment has to be bound together with something that makes it stick together and which also makes it fluid. And the medium of choice was rabbit skin glue. And not only was it used in Chinese silk painting, but it was used in European art as a size to uh, close off the canvas before painting, or as a mixture with ges for gesso, which was with chalk and white pigment, usually titanium white, which would be built up in layers before the application of paint uh, bound either in oil or in tempera. And that I have here. The most expensive of the pigments that I'm using, and this is about five times the price of something like Prussian blue, is malachite. And malachite is a mineral pigment with this wonderful soft green, which you'll see close up soon. The yellow that was used uh, frequently was gamboge. And gamboge is a wonderful, sunny, intense yellow. The problem with gamboge and many yellows in general are that they're fugitive, that with time you lose the yellows. And if you think of tapestries, the verdure tapestries that you see in museums all over, how often you see blues coming through for leaves which should have and would have orig originally been green. And that's because of the fugitive nature of many yellow dyes. The third pigment I'm using is vermilion, and this is an Asian vermilion, all uh, purchased from a specialist uh, colourman supplier in London. And this gives a wonderful scarlety red, I mean a real intensity here. What I couldn't get was an Asian lac. Now lac is a much more pinkish red, and it's very obvious on the painted silks. So what I did manage to get is a a, 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 a lac that is actually based on the cochineal insect. Now cochineal is native to Mexico, the southern states of America, the parts of, of South America, and cochineal is an insect that grows on cacti and it is then harvested and it's the body of the insect and the resin it produces that makes this wonderful colour. It's incredibly similar to the Asian lac, uh, which is called Kermis lacca lacca, and that also is an insect which grows around uh, twigs on particular types of tree and gives out this resinous substance that is then harvested. Some of it is made into shellac, the varnish, which is now used in multiple ways. Uh, and the body of the insect plus this resin is also used for its dye properties. So the dye is extracted and a dye in the way that it's different from a pigment is that a dye on a fabric will go right into the, the cellular structure of the fabric, whereas a pigment sits on the surface. To get the lac pigment, uh, there's a chemical process that takes place which solidifies the, uh, the liquid lac and a pigment is created from that and that's what would go into easel paints, for example. And so there's a huge trade between Asia, between the Americas and Europe to get these pigments all over the world. And they are extremely, some of them are extremely expensive, as I said. Uh, one of the most expensive, of course, are the lac colours because of the uh, labour intensive method of production. And just to show that contrast, the blue that's been detected on these 18th century silks is uh, Prussian blue. Now, Prussian blue was a wonderful invention. It was uh, invented by German chemists in Berlin uh, in the first decade of the 18th century and then it was published in 1820, uh, sorry, 1724 
in scientific papers and once the secret was out and popularised again with another paper in 1731 it became manufactured in increasing number of centres and to just give you an example the cost of 10 grams of Prussian blue is a fifth of the cost of 10 grams of malachite so that gives you an idea of how expensive uh, malachite and other mineral pigments are the wonderful thing about Prussian blue is it was a game changer in terms of European easel painting uh, as well as dye stuffs and pigments uh, globally because it was very close to the colour of ultramarine. Ultramarine is that incredible blue that Titian used for example. You can go and see paintings in the National Gallery where this incredible blue comes out and that's because ultramarine was based upon lapis lazuli. So with Prussian blue you get the replacement of this very expensive ultramarine and you see it used uh, profusely in Chinese painted silks. And the other thing that the East India Company did uh, was of course provide that Prussian blue into Canton from European centres of production. So you have that easy trade where you have a ready supply of the blues. It had effects everywhere. For example, you see it on Japanese ukiyo-e, the woodblock prints, where you get this wave of the use of blue in the woodblock prints, and it was because of the availability of the dye. So these are the things I'm going to be using where I don't stick to the real thing is in the use of this very thick white which is uh, an integral part of Chinese silks and that's because the white was based on lead. It was lead white which is highly toxic. It's still available but not advisable to use. So actually what I've used here is a commercially available highlighting white from a, a fabric art supplier uh, and this will do the job very well as an imitation of the Chinese methods. The brushes I'm using, bar one where I need a very small brush that I couldn't find, is a Chinese type brush. Now Chinese brushes, if we're able to look a little more closely, Chinese brushes are wonderful for very long strokes of colour. They are extremely pointed at the end which means you get accuracy. I've got a set of three that I'll be cracking open shortly. They're very very pointed and they're very thick at the gathering of the hairs here using things like wolf and squirrel, uh, you know natural fibres. So you are able to get a lot of liquid into the head of the brush but it comes out in a very slim way when you paint onto a surface. And what I'm going to do is have a little experiment and show you how the brush strokes vary with various mixtures and proportions of binder to pigment and, and the liquidity of each. So the rabbit skin glue has uh, liquefied now, it doesn't take very long at all. And I'm just going to put a little into the centre of the plate here. And mix my colours. So I'm going to start with the, uh, I'm actually going to make a brown because the colours that we have are a warmish brown, two shades of green, a dark and a lighter shade, a very clear blue which is the Prussian blue, um, very different uh, ranges of intensity for the pinks through to the reds and of course purple. So all can be mixed from these five colours, you don't need anything else to do that. If I just take a little of the glue here and mix in the malachite, this is what gives us the pale green on the silk. And I'm just going to do a little bit of each just to show that colour because I'm having a little experiment before I paint onto the actual silk. And for that I've put a small part onto an embroidery hoop which pulls it nice and tight and you can see how the various pigments behave. So that's my first part, just washing in water, coming through to the the blue, it doesn't matter having a little bit of mix in there, it's such a powerful blue that will drown the green out. And I'm going into the pigments here. Now interestingly enough, Alison McDermott, who's a conservator, 
uh, and she has a specialism in Chinese wallpaper. She very kindly has allowed me to use the slide which shows Chinese 18th century wallpapers. And because of the nature of painting, the techniques, the skills needed, my feeling always has been that this sort of textile, the Chinese painted silks, is more accurately grouped with the wallpapers and even the porcelains that were exported out of Canton where European patterns were used uh, or designs were specified even using more Chinese style designs like you see a little more in the Chinese wallpapers which incidentally bear a resemblance to uh, the bird and blossom style of Chinese painting. Chinese painting of course with its own history is something that is very divided into hierarchies. So silk itself, which you know goes back about 6,000 years, I think the earliest example of a Chinese silk is from about 3000 BC. Silk itself is the uh, support of choice up until about the first century AD when paper is invented. And paper allows greater absorbency so you can uh, paint more quickly and for brush stroke to be preserved. And the phenomenon of the scholar artists, the literati in China who really emerged as a force in the 10th century, they started more and more to use paper because of the, the brush and wash, the ink and wash as it's called, style painting. And the professional artist, who is the artist who really um, supplies imagery for court use, for example, for decorative imagery, but still a professional. The professional artist less frequently practiced this ink and wash style painting and practiced uh, what's known as the Gung Bi style painting, which is very meticulous, very linear, very precise, beautiful range of colours rather than the monochrome of the literati painters. And this style of bird and blossom painting, uh, which was frequently seen amongst the professional artists with that gumbi precise style, those skills are the skills that are exhibited by the artisans in, or artists I should be calling them, the artists in Canton, who are able to very quickly, accurately and delicately apply the pigments. Their relationship with the wallpaper is very close with that in the Chinese painted silks, simply because it is the same techniques and the same skills, the same speed and accuracy. So we have this range of colours, look at that, look at that wonderful pinkness that is so important to the, to the export silks. And that goes across the board, the, the pink is a very, uh, which is the Kermis Laka Laka, as I said, very readily available in Asia. And I'm going to have a little try with the brush because, again, the quality of the brush, as I said, I don't have a very small Chinese brush, so I'm substituting that with a European one. But I'll show you the principle of how the brush stroke works. The more liquid the application of the pigment is, the more it spreads along the warp, which is the length thread, and the weft, the width thread, of the silk. So I'm using here the quite concentrated vermilion with rabbit skin glue and what I haven't introduced you yet is the delight that is the silver. So if we freehand here you can see that when it's nice and thick like this you can make quite long strokes. You press to get thickness and pull away to get the finer application. To make the brown of the branch, I'm just going to, you basically mix everything together to make browns. So although this brush is thick and large, it's very, very fine at the tip. A little dark. Okay, I'm going to have to put some, I'm going to have to put some water in there. So water would be used to make it more uh, fluid. Now my guess is that it was quite possible for two artisans, two painters, to be working on the silk at the same time from either side of the frame that it was stretched upon uh, for speed. You know, speed is of the essence. I'm leaving little gaps there for the 
foliage that's on this particular design to come through. But that that is pretty close to uh, the width. It's a little more delicate, in fact. Wow, it's a little more delicate than the one, the real thing. Okay, whether it spreads a lot more without the rabbit skin glue. Yeah, you can see that. Can you see how much that spreads? Look at the difference the lack of binder makes. Look at that, so I'll have to be very careful with this. Now the last thing, of course, is the application of the highlighting white. As I say, I'm not using lead white, far too poisonous, but I will show you the principle that we're working on, and that is that this white, which I will add some rabbit skin glue to, make it stick, this white can be used either to create a ground layer, which when it dries provides a nice stable white and therefore reflective surface, or it can be mixed to make pastel colours. So the principle is, let's paint here, and you see it doesn't spread because it's nice and thick, so you've got a nice stable layer. So if I do a little blossom here, that's going to be similar to the ones on there, and I'll do just a couple of leaves. There we go. I'll leave that to dry and the principle of uh, pastelization, if I just take that and you can see you get a different quality when I paint over the top of the dry white you'll get a different quality of colour which you can paint straight on as you see here. Now while it's wet, what you can do is work into it. I'm just going to work into the top and I'm going to use a bit of vermilion here and I'm going to add a tiny amount of the lac just to make it slightly pinker. It's a little bit redder than the colour there but look how you can work into it while it's wet. You can get that detail and if I li liquefy it a little more I'm also going to make it far less bright. Just add it into the rabbit skin glue, which of course will give it much more staying power. There we are, you can see that. And that's working into the wet. And I can also leave it until it's dry and have it much more precise. And you would keep adding in deeper and deeper colours as you want the tones to go together. One thing worth remembering, to take the colours down when you have a, a colour used straight from the pigment or the pot, it's often very bright, rather uh, can be rather crude. Um, just the principle of complementary colours. So I applied the pink onto this experiment here and you can see that it's rather bright. So all I do, all I need to do is I choosing to take a little amount of the carmine here to get that wonderful pinkish tone and then add a little of the vermilion to sharpen it slightly to get that mix between them and then in order to take it down other than diluting which you can see here if I paint this straight onto the silk, you'll see that that's still slightly sweet and strong uh, and, it, and certainly compared with the original. If you go on the complementary colour, so you more or less take greenish tones uh, to make the complementary for uh, red, of course, the complementary is green. So if I add a little green here, I can just calm it all down a little bit, keep on adding it until the colour feels right. And that's the same principle. It's like when you're painting flesh tones and you get blues into the shadows, essentially the opposite of the sort of orangey, yellowy, pinky shades of pale skin. And you can see here compared with this, 
it's more subtle. Now, if only it was really as quick as that to paint this, that was about two hours work you've just seen in a few seconds. And I did carry on a little bit afterwards just to get the design a little bit further uh, advanced. And now I'm going to be adding the fine things because on the motifs on the Chinese painted silk that I'm showing you, everything is edged. So the leaves are edged in blue for the blue leaves, in dark green for the green leaves. The flowers are also edged and that's in silver and this is the real finishing uh, touch that makes these silks so exquisite and which never survives on the historic pieces because of course silver oxidizes. And so I'll just show you some details uh, close up so you can really see how it's done. And to do this I'll be using both uh, brushes and I have treated myself to a couple of very good sable brushes sadly not Chinese here, uh, but to get the, the, the tiny detail that I wanted so that I could uh, really control it. And I also made a couple of bamboo pens. Now, 18th century travellers to China attested that bamboo pens would be used uh, uh, in households. So I literally got a bamboo from out of the garden, just readjusted a plant and cut the, uh, the ends of the bamboo off and just sharpened them, whitt whittled them away uh, to make a nib and cut a, a very fine slice onto the end of the nib so that there was a little reservoir. And I'm actually going to use that because I think that's probably the method that was used by the Chinese artists themselves. And I'm going to start with the malachite to edge the green leaves, the malachite leaves, which will darken them where I paint them. And I'm just going to test out, always you need a rough patch to test out how they paint is coming out. I will move to this and try and do the leaves. My leaves are rather more bouncy and uh, joyful than the leaves on the original. I haven't been entirely accurate in that, but there you go. Oh yes, that absolutely does the job. You can see how delicate it is with this split-ended bamboo. And I'm also going to just do the stem because when you look very very closely on the painted silks you will see that the stems have an almost well it's almost blackish edges now you might assume that this is a printed pattern underneath and in some cases it would be but on my particular sample it's not it's uh it's too irregular to have been printed It's incredibly delicate, but the only way you can get it so fine is to have very, very little pigment on your applicator. So you can see I've got much closer to the original. Uh, by adding the edging, the lines, to the stem, to the leaves here, making it much more strong and definite. But the finishing touch is going to be the addition of silver. Where I've got a commercially manufactured silver powder here. You can see that I'm just going to mix into the rabbit skin glue. And you get a wonderful sheen with it. And I'm going to apply it. I've, in practice I've found that the most accurate replication of the kind of line that I have is the uh, use of the bamboo pen. So I'm going to try that here first of all and see how it goes on the actual silk. And this silver edging actually recalls the use of silver on Indian chintzes which predate the Chinese silks and it's actually this whole trade with the East through the East India Company that I explore in the full length lecture.
So I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration of my attempt to replicate a Chinese 18th century painted silk exported to Britain around about 1770 and I have to say it's been a thoroughly enjoyable experience for me too. Thank you.